This is something that is very interesting. It's the beginning. And at the beginning of this particular interview, I want to read something that will explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. It is from Isaiah chapter 58. If you get to your Bible, turn to Isaiah 58 and go down to verse 10. First of all, what happens is Isaiah speaks about in the first part of the chapter here, he speaks about the fast and all of the things that the people of Israel are doing. You know, they're doing this for the Lord and that for the Lord, but that's not really what God is talking about here. And Isaiah says, that's not really what God wants. So many people are involved in the culture, but I'm gonna tell you what God really wants. He says in verse 10, he says, if you pour out yourself, if you pour out yourself for the hungry, and you satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then you shall light the right, your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually. He will satisfy your desire in scorched places and he will make your bones strong. I love that part. And you shall be like a well-watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Now, this is a part that I really enjoy. And your ancient ruins, your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. Rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach. The repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. I'm here with Jim Canelon, and... Uh, that scripture hangs in my house, and it has since I've been married, along with Proverbs 5, and it's very, or 3, 5, and it's very good because that really was the, the beginning of the ministry that Janice and I carried. And uh, dad, of course, being involved with that, and of course, uh, her dad, who is excellent, and her mom, who is uh, good and, and uh, all of that. But it's interesting because what happens is we were launched from this scripture. We were told, this is the scripture that I'm going to launch you with. Now, I've been through a lot in the last several years. You know, I always thought that because I never drank or I never smoke, I was okay. I could do all this supernatural stuff. <laughs> I was wrong because I've had some things that happened here and there, but I've learned some things. And I was launched in this idea of missions, launched in this idea of helping. Now, Jim is, of course, leading Vision Led. That's an organization in the United States. He's also the head of WOW, which stands for what? Working for Orphans and Widows. So... In this ministry, and as we explore this idea, what in, in it's wow in Canada and mm -hmm. it's vision led in the United States. Yeah. So what in the world is that? What do you do? Well, it all began, I was pastoring uh, Broadway Church in Vancouver back in the uh, uh, latter uh, half of the 1990s. Uh, smack dab in the middle of the poorest postal code in all of Canada. People find it hard to believe that Vancouver has the poorest postal code, but it does. It's in East Vancouver. My church was in East Vancouver, a beautiful multi-million dollar building with a very affluent congregation. Six blocks away from where my office was, was Hastings and Maine, the epicenter of Canada's poverty. And as soon as I arrived in Vancouver, I immediately went into the East Hastings and Maine area began to walk the alleyways, saw the mainly Aboriginal women, you know, with uh, uh, holes in their arms, uh, desiccated, uh, stricken, uh, looking more dead than alive, uh, needles and uh, condoms and, and disease. And I, I started searching out little ministries that were trying to help these women. And in the process, I began to bring them into Broadway once a month, and I'd feed them with good food, and I'd say, no, talk to me. Tell me about your work. How can we pray together? We ended up having a, having a tremendous partnership. But in the process, Rod, I was exposed to the ravages of HIV and AIDS. I had no interest in HIV and AIDS at that point in time. I had no reason to be interested. Uh, suddenly, I'm confronted with it. And I started doing some research and discovered that East Vancouver has the highest intravenous drug-related HIV rate in the world. Hello. In the, in the world. In the world. In the world. And as I'm researching it, I'm... I'm confronted with the pandemic of HIV and AIDS, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. But what really got me was this. 
it's, it was and continues to be the biggest orphan and widow maker in the history of mankind. More orphans, more widows on the planet because of HIV than for any other reason ever in history. And, you know, I, I, I'm studying the scriptures and, and Isaiah 58, interestingly, you should mention this, became a critical, critical component in my thinking. And then I run into uh, David's words in, uh, in uh, Psalm 68, verse 5, where, it's a, where he says, God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. He is God in his holy habitation. And I'm thinking, hello, uh, this makes perfect sense. If God so loves the world, and he does, it's got to begin with the lowest common denominator, and there's nothing lower than the orphan and the widow. Well, I'm putting all, you know, two and two together, and the Lord's working on me, and I'm pastoring this big church, you know, the big, big congregation, a big budget. And um, what I'm seeing just a few blocks from the church and what the Lord is showing me in the scripture begins to grab a hold of my soul, and I realize that he had called me out to Broadway, not for the reasons I had, I had, uh, I had thought. That's often the way the Lord works, right? Uh, it wasn't to establish a, a strong, you know, ministry to the Pacific Rim, uh, even though I still had vision for Broadway in that sense, but it was to expose me to the greatest orphan and widowmaker in the history of all time and to launch me in a pioneering effort to try to motivate and mobilize the churches of sub-Saharan Africa to care for orphans and widows. And so that's how it started, Rod. I, I was so moved by it that uh, I incorporated Vision Led in uh, November of uh, uh, 99, started full bore in January 2000. Kathy and I resigned the church. For the next eight months, we lived uh, out of suitcases. I had no income. I had no fixed address. I mean, I was 52 years of age. My friends thought that I was going through some kind of latter-day midlife crisis. They thought that was nuts. What are you going to do, Jim? I said, well, I really don't know. I just, the Lord's speaking to me about orphans and widows, and I, I, that's about it. Well, the upshot of it is, I went to the people I knew, and, and I knew quite a few pastors in South Africa, because, as you know, back in 1981, the Israeli government invited me to plant a church in Jerusalem, which we did, King of Kings, still there to this day. While I'm there, people are coming from all over the world, including from South Africa. There was a connection. They said, you got to come down and speak to our conferences and your conventions. And so several times during the years we were in Israel, uh, there we were in South Africa, not knowing the Lord was setting us up for something that would happen down the line. Sure enough, I go back to South Africa years later to meet these young guys, young men in the ministry that I had kind of bonded with in those Jerusalem years. And from there we started not really knowing what we were doing. But uh, slowly, slowly, the thing built, 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 and today, 17 years later, almost 18 years later now, uh, I look at our you know, annual report and I just can't believe what God's doing. God's done a miracle. Oh, well, really, I mean, I, and I, you know, in the, um, you know, the, the, in the scripture it says, despise not the day of small beginnings. And it seems to me, and I, you know, this is anecdotal, but I can't recall any significant ministry I've run into in Africa that didn't start with one person ministering to one person. One, one, on, on, one. one on one. And when it's ordered of the Lord and anointed by the Holy Spirit, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. It grows exponentially. And just as the Lord supplies the need for the ministry to one, he supplies the need for ministry to 100, to 1,000, to 100,000. And I've seen it happen again and again. And now I'm involved in the, you know, scores of thousands of orphans and widows and churches. And, you know, I... What was, what was the first... Okay, you've got yeah, this... Yeah. The, back to the, the thing with the, the church. You, you found the people with mm -hmm. HIV and all that mm -hmm. stuff. You did all that. But what, what was the main ministry that you started with in Africa? Oh, I, I, started, I started with um, uh, the churches trying to raise awareness. So you went into the churches. I went into the churches, and and uh, I got. How'd that go? Not not well. I got pushed back, uh, pastor after pastor. Whether it was South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, they would say to me, oh, "Well, Pastor Jim, uh, we don't have an HIV and AIDS issue. That's you know, that's for the sinners." We, 
I say, excuse me, Pastor, I just preached in your congregation a few minutes ago, and I'm looking down at these 30 people who have slim disease, as you call it. Well, what do you mean? I said, the people who have no, no, no flesh on their bones, who have these vacant stares in their eyes, who are coughing continuously, obviously they've got tuberculosis, or they have uh, other kinds of opportunistic diseases. I've seen people with skin diseases in, in your congregation. Oh, that's from bad water. I said, you know what? These are people who don't have an immune system. And they don't have an immune system because of HIV. That's what HIV does. And they would push back like crazy. I, I remember one, uh, I, I, I met with 30 pastors in Dar es Salaam early on, which is Tanzania. Spend a whole, whole day with them. And after my presentation, uh, I had feedback, which I always invite. And uh, I could tell that this was a hard sell to this group. And, and this one pastor who was more daring than the rest, says, Pastor Jim, those HIV people are only getting what they deserve. Mm. This is God's judgment on them for sexual immorality. Mm. I said, excuse me, Pastor, where would you be? Where would I be if we got what we deserved? But that was, you know, in the, in the initial years, I felt like a stranger in a strange land, a prophet crying in the wilderness. And believe me, it was tough. But slowly, slowly, we began to get traction uh, because of the fact that Pastors were doing three and four funerals a week. I, I would go out to cemeteries. A three or four funerals a, a week? week? A week, yeah, a week. Uh, I, 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 I'd never seen cemeteries, and, and it still is the case, like in sub-Saharan Africa. Totally jammed. They, 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 they would start by burying people between the graves, okay? You know, usually there's about, what, three meters, two, sure, two yeah. three meters between the yeah. grave? They start burying people between the graves. Then they started burying people vertically. And then when that, when that would all fill up, then they would go out to uh, vacant plots of land uh, on the outskirts of the village or the town or the city. Start a new cemetery. And, and start a new cemetery um, because there was, I, I, remember, I remember being at um, one cemetery in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, early on. And uh, this is when they were just considering burying people vertically because it takes less space. And this, uh, I was sitting, standing in the shade of a tree. There were about 15 funerals going on within my sight. And I was talking to one of the undertakers. And uh, I said, well, what about this vertical idea? He said, we're getting real pushback. They, 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 don't, they don't feel that's dignified. He said, we don't know what we're going to do. But the fact is that the uh, cemeteries were overloaded. And uh, people were dying. Uh, it was like the plague, you know. And the thing about it is with HIV and AIDS, it's such a subtle sort of stealth thing. It doesn't come on you instantly. You, you, you contract the virus and it might take uh, a few years before it really has its impact on you. But meanwhile, if you're having sex, you're infecting everybody you're having sex with. And so even while you think you're healthy, you're infecting other people and eventually it catches up and you have this, this snowball that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it rolls down the mountain to the point where um, uh, a whole, um, uh, generation of uh, young Africans, especially, was wiped out. I mean, I, 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 we'd, we'd go into a community where, where you, you couldn't find young adults. They're all, they're all dead. And something that I had never seen before and something I deal with all of the time, and it kills me all of the time, dealing with childhood and households. Mm. Both parents are dead. So you got this little 12-year-old who's the adult raising his three-year-old and his five-year-old brother and sister. He has, he has to provide the food, he has to provide the shelter, he has to provide the protection. And of course, he can't go to school because he's got to be out there in the streets selling, you know, whatever little stuff he can find to sell. Because uh, he's trying to make money for the well, younger yeah. family. Well, yeah, I mean, with no food security, you know, nothing to do with, with a fever or illness. Um, you see kids who are wearing rags, and they've been wearing the same shirt and the same pair of shorts, you know, for the last two years. Um, no shoes, of course, uh, diseased beyond description, uh, dysentery, uh, diarrhea is just a matter of course, everybody has it, that's, that's, that's the norm, because they're drinking uh, polluted water, and you know. So you see all this. I see all this, and I, and I say, well, well, where's the church in Africa? Like, the church is everywhere in Africa, I mean, you know, every corner it seems has a church on it, and and, and so as I began, you know, working with pastors and discovering that they're just basically uh, like the parable of the Good Samaritan walking by on the other side. Ignoring it. Uh, totally ignoring it. And so I started holding pastors conferences to raise awareness. And initially it was very difficult. I started the first time I had, I had um, 30 guys for two hours 
one afternoon in Zimbabwe or in uh, Zambia. Well, that has grown over the years. I'll have anywhere from four to six thousand now attending these conferences for three days. And what I do, I bring in special uh, speakers, medical experts, uh, special uh, pastors of large churches who have evangelistic gifts and are highly respected by these other guys. And then I will do the keynote and also the follow up to uh, what the Bible says about righteousness and justice. To me, everything is predicated on righteousness and justice. Right relationship with God, right relationship with neighbor. This is where Isaiah 58 comes in. Right. See, the sin of, of Judah mm -hmm. in Isaiah 58 was, on the day of your fast, mm -hmm. you seek your own pleasure and you exploit all your workers. What does that mean? You have this religious ceremony for your own pleasure. You're out of whack. You're, 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 you're out of sync with heaven. You're not there to please yourselves, you're there to please the Lord, but you're just pleasing yourself. So your ceremony, your special clothing, your music, you know, the feasting or fasting, whatever, uh, it's all for your own pleasure. It's your, it's your religious, cultural joy. And God says, you're here for my pleasure, not your own. And to the extent that you reduce the worship experience to your own pleasure, you're guilty of unrighteousness. You're out of sync with heaven. Mm. And you exploit all your workers. A fast day meant a universal cessation from labor. Nobody was to be working. Well, this was a time of unprecedented prosperity in the history of Israel and Judah. There was uncharacteristic talk of the summer homes, the winter homes of the well-to-do. And you had well-to-do Israelites who were, who were employing um, other Israelites who were not well-to-do. So they come to a fast day like this. The, the middle, upper middle and wealthy people come because they can afford it. But those who can't afford it are continuing to work to keep the oil of the economy going. The Lord looks at this situation and says, there's something wrong with this picture. That's unjust. You cannot make a socioeconomic uh, distinction between yourself and your brothers and sisters who are working for you. And until you understand that, I'm not going to presence myself in your solemn assembly. And this is, this is why they, 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 they come to Isaiah. They say, well, it's the more spiritually perceptive ones, what's going on here? And Isaiah doesn't like what the Lord says to him. So the Lord says, look, shout out, don't hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, announce to my people the rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. And he says, they're seeking me daily, uh, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. Uh, they, they ask of me righteous judgments or righteousness and justice. They delight to draw near to God. I mean, they're the ideal congregation. What pastor wouldn't love these people? And so they say, why do we fast, but you don't see? We humble ourselves, you don't notice. Or it's just because of the day of your fast. You seek your own pleasure, you exploit all your workers. You're unrighteous, you're unjust. Well, I approach the churches of Africa that way. I say, look, you guys think you've got the righteousness side of the equation pretty well cased, and to a certain extent you do, but there's no justice. And it's not either or, it's both and. You guys are walking past orphans every day. You've been doing it for years. And what I do is I challenge them to go back to their villages after today's conference. And I said, that little orphan boy that you know well by visual sight, but you've never asked him his name, I want you to stop, get down on your knees, look him right in the eye. Introduce yourself to him, ask him his name. And say, take me to your mother. And that, take his hand. As he leads you to his mother, talk to him. Get to his mom and say, I'm Pastor So-and-so. We have been neglecting you. I want you to know that from now on, my church is going to care for you and your orphan son. Then I warned them. I said, number one, do not tell me you don't have money to do this. Don't insult your heavenly father. Because God knows. Well, I mean, he's, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, money is nothing to him, right? I mean, you're going to say, oh, God doesn't have enough money for that. No, excuse me. Don't insult him that way. Don't, don't impose your poverty mentality on God. But secondly, understand this. That as you minister faithfully to that one little orphan and widowed household, one will become two, two will become four, four will become eight. Now let me just tell you a quick story. A few years ago, we, we divided our, our pastor's conferences in Zambia up into two because we had too many guys coming. So we decided that one of the conferences would be in a place called Kapiri and Poshi, which is, it is the worst place on the planet. It, it's just a hole, it's awful. And when my people on the ground said, we want to do it in Kapiri and Poshi, I thought, oh no. Well, okay, if you think so. And I figured, you know, maybe we'll get 200 people. We had 2,000 people come. Mm. And then we had the other conference about an hour and a half south. The next year we brought them back together again. It was too intractable trying to do two conferences at the same time. Anyhow, during a break in the next conference the next year in, in Cowboy Zambia, 
uh, six pastors from Kapir and Poshi come up to me. Pastor, 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 pastor. They call me pastor. I figure I'm a pizza when I was. <laughs> pastor, do you have a minute? Do you have, I said, oh, sure, sure. They introduced themselves to me. We're from Kapir and Poshi. We were at your conference last year. I said, oh, terrific. You remember how you challenged us to work together, you know, the various denominations, which we'd never done before? I said, yeah. Well, we do, we're all six denominations. We pastor the six churches in Kapir and Poshi. We decided we'd work together. You remember you challenged us to care for one orphan and one widow? I said, yeah. Well, we decided to do that. I said, terrific. Each of you are looking after one orphan and one widow? No, no. The six of us together would look after one orphan and mm -hmm. one widow. Mm. I said, well, I, that wasn't exactly what I had in mind, but I'm glad you did something. So it's been a year. How's it going? Huge smiles in their face. Dramatic pause. And the guy says to me, that's why we wanted to talk to you, Pastor. Today we're caring for 11,000. 11,000. 11,000. And he said, well, as you promised, without any help from the West. He said, the Lord has supplied the need for 11,000, just like he supplied the need for that first little family we started out with. And I mean, I, I just I, I just felt like, okay, Lord, take me home now. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, mission accomplished. But what I'm finding is that more and more now, uh, I've been at this for almost 18 years, uh, countless churches are experiencing this. They don't have to have a church growth seminar, you mm -hmm. know, some kind of sterile uh, strategic plan for mm -hmm. church growth. Mm -hmm. All you need to do to, tr to grow a church is to care for the poor. Go visit the orphan. That's right. The orphan, the widow, the poor, the, the, the broken. Uh, these are the people that Jesus died for. These are the people he came for. He said, look, I didn't come for healthy people. I came for sick people. The point being we're all sick, but we, the sooner we realize sure. it, the better. Sure. Um, but um, these churches are busting out and, and are planting satellite congregations because they discovered the secret to the uh, everyday presence of the Holy Spirit is to care for the broken. And the broken in Sub-Saharan Africa begin with the orphan and the widow impacted by HIV and AIDS. So ministry to the dying is still the number one priority of Vision Led and WOW. Um, and I, uh, I was looking at our, we have a little report book here on, on our uh, last year of ministry. And uh, w through our volunteers from the various churches, we did 270,000 mm. uh, home-based care visits to the dying last year. The thing about this is that we not only care for them and show interest in them as they're lying there with fevers and tuberculosis and oral thrush and dysentery and bed sores uh, and, and social um, alienation, uh, we, we, we don't just have our volunteers you know, care for the, all that stuff, we have them touch them, uh, talk with them just about stuff, bring them up to date on what's happening in the world, uh, uh, pray with them, uh, show them respect treat them with dignity, and lead them to Jesus. And we haven't had one yet say, no, I don't want to meet the Lord. Mm. And so, and, and people say- 270,000. Last year alone. And they, I've had, I've had detractors say to me, well, well, excuse me, Jim, you're just exploiting these people in their, in their affliction. I say, no, I know this as a pastor, that people are never more in tune with themselves than when they are afflicted. That's when they realize what their real values are and what, their, what, what, what really matters is. That's when their mind is the clearest. And uh, these people are committing their lives to Jesus and uh, dying with Jesus. I, you know, I would love to claim that you know, everybody we prayed for got healed. That's, that's not the Lord's plan. We have to remember something, that from the Lord's perspective, there's no sorrow in death. No. When yeah. you die, when I die, that's our moment of entry into what we were created for. Yeah. We are created for life on the other side. This life we live right now in the flesh is just a seed dying in the ground. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there comes a point in all of our lives where that germination of the spirit will break through into the heavenlies and will become the planting of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's what it's all about. But I must say, uh, Rod, I'm, I'm blown away by this experience. Um, the horizon just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we, in some countries like Zimbabwe and Mozambique, we, we were able to establish uh, ministries that were sustainable. Uh, in Zambia and uh, Malawi, uh, which are, especially Malawi, which is so pick and poor, uh, we, we have powerful ministry, but we haven't reached the, age, the stage of sustainability yet. Also in Northern Uganda, 
But now we're, we've just received invitations to Ghana, to Thailand, to Ethiopia. And you know, uh, the horizon just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And for a guy like me, who was motivated by Far Horizons, and I'm a, I'm a trailblazer, uh, I'm right in my sweet spot. Sure. What else are you doing besides this, this whole uh, challenging of the churches, get involved? Well, we, you're, uh, you're, people, you're doing other things, yeah, well, people, people say to me, you know, my elevator speech, so what are you doing as we go from floor two to floor six? <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, tr we mobilize churches and we transform communities. Mobilize churches. Transform communities. Transform communities. We, we have a whole approach to communities called community transformation. We, we don't deal with individual uh, groupings. We deal with entire communities. And some of those communities are 50, 60, 75, 80, 100,000 people. We go in, we work with the, uh, the, the chiefs, the, um, the uh, um, what do they call them, regional authorities, uh, the, the basically the governmental leaders. Uh, we get permission from them to work in their communities. And then we go into the community and we work with the orphans and widows in those communities through the local churches. Everything we do, we do is brokered through local churches. So as far as, uh, say, Malawi is concerned, the government of Malawi is concerned, uh, Vision Led Wow is a genius. Why? Because everything is being done by Africans and it's all being uh, uh, managed by local churches. These white people, that we hardly ever see them. We know they're there, but you know, it's our own people who are ministering to our own people. That to me is the key to it. That's where sustainability lies. And so we will go into a community that is near death. And we've been in several of them. We start working on the grassroots level with the, with the widows and the orphans. Slowly, 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 the Lord builds them back. We train the widows in income generation. We train them in tailoring, raising pigs, growing corn, making and selling soap, jewelry. They start making money for themselves. We get them banking as, as a unit together. Um, we, we build a school. We get their orphans into school. Uh, you know, we get them uniforms and shoes and books. And this is part of transforming the community. And, and what happens? The church. Is, all being done through the local church. Jesus gets the glory and the community is transformed. How effective is this? I'll tell you how effective it is. The European Union twice now have sent our champion in Malawi to Fiji. They see Fiji as just about as poor as Malawi is, and they want to introduce our community transformation model to Fiji. And so they've sent our gal there twice at their expense, the European Union, to introduce our, our concept. And she has made it clear to them that this is not really gonna work until we get Jim in there and get the churches, <laughs> get the churches on board. <laughs> but, but you know, at least, yeah. at least it's a start. But we, the church is the critical player. Community is the target. The entire community is to be transformed to the power of Christ. And um, uh, we're seeing it happen on such a scale that it boggles my mind. And I, I, I even hesitate to say it publicly because it sounds unrealistic, but it's happening. That is amazing, and one of the things that's interesting to me is you think about the culture here. You think about North America, you think about all of the media saying all of the things, and, and we get tied up into that. And there was people mm. that I knew um, that were involved in a African outreach, and the agency leader said to me, well, we have to get this person over there, get him over there to be seen on television with the people, otherwise they won't give to him. And I thought that's interesting because they're trying to raise money themselves mm -hmm. for themselves mm -hmm. and then give a little piece off to yeah. them. That's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it's, wrong, it's, Jim. It's putting, the horse, it's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, you know, I have this, um, this little mantra that I, I always bring out to pastors in, in my pastor's conferences. God does not front load. He does not say, here's a billion dollars. Now go on and do something good with it. What he says is, you do a billion dollar job, I'll pay the bills. He moves into the room we make for him, but he never uh, front loads what we're doing. Meaning that every step of the way, and this is true for me after eight, almost 18 years now, I have to depend on the Lord. Our people have to depend on the Lord. The Lord doesn't show up, we, we fall flat in our face. And I'm always over committing because, and drives my staff crazy. But, <laughs> but, I, but I, believe, I believe where the Lord wants us is to be in a state where we're constantly in need of his provision. 
because the need is so huge. We're not there to feather our own nest. And by the way, you know this, workman's worthy of his hire. Mm -hmm. The Lord looks after those who do his work. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about that. But the fact is that if you put, you know, the kingdom of heaven first, and the ministry to the poor, and, uh, you know, and the, the broken and the afflicted, the orphan, the widow first, everything else falls into place. Now, what happens if somebody wants to uh, to give to the ministry or to do whatever? What do you do with the money? Like, how does that work? Well, uh, I'm just looking at our uh, annual report from uh, last year. Here's how it works. 88.6% uh, goes to the various um, ministry programs that we've Through the churches. Yeah, through the churches, 88.6%. 6.8% goes to fundraising and awareness which is what I'm up to all of the time. Mm -hmm. And then 4.6% goes to admin. So That's that, great. Yeah, so, and then to, just to break it down further, uh, in terms of our areas of focus, 26% uh, of our focus is on what we call community infrastructure, mm -hmm. wells, uh, latrines, uh, feeding programs for orphans, that, that kind of thing. Then we have a specific 25% just for feeding programs themselves. 17% of our commitments go to healthcare. 10% goes to education, 10% goes to gender-based violence programs. That's we, a big one. We have become champions of beleaguered women who are being abused by men. Uh, and and, and all, all the countries where we work see us as the model. Our gender-based violence uh, ministry is phenomenal. Tell me about that. Just stop here and tell me about that for a minute. Okay. How does that work? Oh, that's how it works. You want to hear this? I want to hear it. Okay. Three years ago, two little five-year-old girls were raped by a man in one of our villages in Maloney. I met these little girls and their mother just shortly after it happened. It was so abhorrent, so in your face, that even a culture that was used to rape were totally offended by this. And so our people on the ground there in Maloney got a bunch of women in that community together and printed up t-shirts for them, which we paid for. And the t-shirt said, silent no more. Silent no silent more. Silent no more. And then 35 of these women wearing these t-shirts went to the home of this rapist and surrounded his home and called him out. He came out not knowing what was up. And they confronted him with what he had done and he, he was being arraigned in court. So, you know, it, it, the police had been informed of what he'd done, but he still hadn't appeared in court. And these fine Christian women said, we are going to appear in court against you. And what's more, you will never do this again. Because if you ever try to rape anybody again, we will deal with you in Jesus' name. <laughs> well, you know, I think this guy, he, his eyes bugged out and, and, and he rushed back into his, in, into his uh, little hovel, you know, as if he'd seen the devil. And these women did what they said. Well, the word got out all through Malawi. Silent no more, silent no more. And we, we developed momentum and we, we began to do this in all the villages where we're working. Not as in your face intimidating as that first situation. It didn't have to be that way ever again. Just the once was enough. But the point is, they suddenly realized that there was this army of women who are not going to tolerate rapists. Mm. And um, we then, out of that, Rod, we developed Malawi's first rape crisis center. It's still being built, actually. We've got this beautiful rape crisis center right in Olongwe, and already all kinds of abused women are, are finding refuge there. It's like a city of refuge. And this in itself is having a huge impact in Malawi because people realize if a woman is raped and left for dead, we get her to the rape crisis center and they'll be cared for. Um, and so we have a whole new momentum in Malawi to protect women that started with Silent No More. Mm -hmm. So we, we then began to develop a gender-based violence program and we're starting to, uh, to apply to other countries where we're working. 7% of our programs go to sustainability and agricultural projects, 3% to in-depth bio training. We graduated, uh, or we, we trained uh, almost 500 young adults last year in uh, biblical um, uh, skills. Uh, and they're training to be pastors, also lawyers, doctors, teachers, but who are biblically literate. And as a part of their training, we have to do X number of hours of social justice, basically for orphans and widows in the villages where they live. So they have to do social justice That's right. with the training. That's part right. of the training. They gotta deal with people who are raped, they gotta deal with 
uh, people who are hungry, people who are sick, and they have to be servants of their community as they're training. And then they write very significant exams, tough exams. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. And then 2% of our focus goes on what we call skills and small business training, and that's where we are training um, uh, widows in income generation. IGA, it's called. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Most of the work that you do in these two countries is all about sustaining and maintaining the church and the community. Yeah. That's what it's about. That's what it's about in Jesus' name. And I, I really do mean in Jesus' name because you, you know, whether you, what, you go into any of our work in, in Zambia or Malawi or Northern Uganda, and uh, they'll say it's all about Jesus. And that, that to me is a critical component. We're not, we're, not, uh, uh, we're not shying away from righteousness. We're leading people to Jesus all the time. But the justice element is the, new, the yeah. new and key element, which provides us with uh, not only credibility, but with um, governmental, um, uh, not support because they don't give us any money, but governmental permissions. And I've always believed that if you're going to influence any institution, you have to influence institutional leadership. So if it's a high school, you got to go to the principal. If it's a town or a city, you got to go to the mayor. If it's a country, you got to go to the president or the, or the prime minister. The, the, the leaders have to know who you are, and they've got to say to those who ask, they're okay, they're good, they've come, they've come to see me, they keep me updated, they got my, they got my vote. And, and, and it's not rocket science. It takes a little time and effort to do it, but to me, there's no point in uh, trying to um, act in a stealthy manner. Sure. I like to be right up front and right, as engaged as possible with the leadership of these various institutions and communities. This is why Isaiah 58 is important to me. What you've shared, what you've talked about, what you've done up front with the community, with the churches, that's the key. Mm. And it's got to be touching people is what he says here. Yeah. And, you know, you look at this and it says things like, and your ancient ruins shall mm. be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. This is verse 12. Yeah. And shall, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Generations, right. Now, I can imagine, you know, going in there and seeing all the HIV res mm. results and all that. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. Yeah, yeah. The restorer of the paths yeah. to dwell in. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's about. That's that's what it's about, and that's what um, the empowered body of Christ can and should be doing. And that's why it's so important that uh, our churches in Africa are doing this. Um, my role, you know, when when the Lord laid this on me, this ministry which I called Vision Led. Um, and now we work under the moniker of WOW in Canada, working for orphans and widows. But when he laid it on me, he gave me one word, catalyst. I was to be a catalyst to something much bigger than myself. And you know, what's interesting about a catalyst. You can have, you know, three or four mounds of explosives just sitting there inert, doing nothing. You bring a little catalyst to the, to the party, <laughs> <laughs> and kaboom! That's right. You got this massive explosion. Like a catalyst has punch way beyond its weight, right? Well, I, you know, I'm a pretty big guy. I got a lot of weight, but uh, as a catalyst, I, I'm just I'm just a tiny player. I, you know, I, uh, people uh, people say, well, "What do you do?" I I say, "I, I schlep water." You know, the Lord asked me to schlep water in Malawi. I schlep water in Malawi until He tells me to stop. I'm no I'm no big deal, but it's amazing what the Lord can do with little people like us if we're just willing to, you know, lay it on the line and, and be obedient, you know, without asking a lot of tough questions and without getting stuck on ourselves. Mm. Lay it on the line mm. and be obedient. Yeah. It's, Something we need to hear today. Yeah, it's not rocket science. Yeah, it's not rocket science. It's just, it's just. We've got 50,000 ways to do things, but just bottom line is the Bible, the word of God. Yeah. Lay it on the line, be obedient. Be obedient, yeah. And, and, and have fun. Of course. I don't think, <laughs> I, I don't think you can do the will of God without it being fun. You know, well, I, I really, I really have a problem with these people. Oh, I'm working for Jesus, man. It is so tough, man. I'm doing the work. You know what he says? What Jesus says about that? He says, guys, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You put your trust in the Lord and you don't have to rely on your own strength. And it's fun. 
I remember my dad, I, one day I asked my dad why he wasn't taking more vacation. He says, why would I take vacation? I said, well, you know, you need to rest, relax. He says, you know what, Jim? Doing the Lord's work, I'm having so much fun. I don't know when I'm working and when I'm not. I said, well, gee, well, there, that's, a good, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer. That is good. I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I would yeah. do what I'm doing for free. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. And it's something that, that I had to learn as well in life. And I, Yes, indeed, you did. I indeed did have to learn that. <laughs> well, I'll go into detail. But, but I, I, won't, I will not, uh, not now, I won't go no. into detail. But it's, it's good to hear about vision led and about wow. And, uh, you know, quick study television, we, we give our tithes because we believe the Lord says give tithes, but we give our tithes to, to the organization. And uh, we trust what you're doing because, and soon, we'll go to Africa. Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 uh, I really want your, your viewers to know this, that uh, quick study with Rod's direction and I have uh, entered into a, an yep. agreement that we're going to work together in, um, in the U.S. especially. Um, and uh, Rod will be in Africa, God willing, many times with me and our team. And we're just going to go full bore presenting to your U.S. audience uh, this exciting horizon. And, you know, I, I could see days ahead, uh, Rod, where uh, groups of your viewers Absolutely. might want to just come on with you, you know, and see for themselves what's going on. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole horizon of uh, ministry opportunity there.